Hi. Name is Bonnie. I'm a PhD candidate in Dr. Lisa Galea's lab, also a Women Mind funded trainee. So I'm very excited to be here today and to introduce the Hot Topics Young Investigators Symposium. Um, for the lightning round, these trainees will showcase their innovative work featuring cutting edge research in a fast paced series of presentations. And again, I'm very honored and excited to introduce them today because they are the next generation of researchers to lead the way in advancing women's health research. So without further ado, our first speaker is Anne Kristen Kimmig from University of Tübingen. Hello everyone and thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, present uh, the study I performed uh, during my PhD. And uh, this study was uh, motivated, I'm just clicking to continue. It doesn't work. I'm just gonna live here now. <laughs> Okay. Um, this study was motivated um, by the fact that mood disturbances are a common reason uh, for oral contraceptive discontinuation. However, we don't actually know a lot about the neuroendocrine mechanisms underlying it. And there are first uh, studies suggesting that mood lability during oral contraceptive intake is linked to um, altered patterns in functional brain connectivity. Um, however, we don't actually know how this is associated with the hormones. There is this hypothesis of a hypoprogestogenic functional brain um, state during oral contraceptive intake because uh, the patterns found mimic and exaggerate those found also in uh, menstrual cycle studies, or especially looking at the luteal phase. However, there's not really any study yet who has directly linked the synthetic and endogenous sex hormones to functional brain connectivity or mood. So this was the aim of this study uh, where we wanted to assess whether changes in hormonal profiles are linked uh, to changes in functional brain um, architecture and mood. And for this, uh, we used uh, a longitudinal design where we measured women either um, in stable hormonal profiles um, or in um, drastically changing hormonal profiles as a function of or contraceptive initiation or discontinuation. And uh, we calculated the different scores between those two sessions in the long longitudinal design and um, put them into a distance matrix. So basically um, we had for each modality a distance matrix showing how different or similar one person is to another. And uh, by doing this, we um, saw that changes in functional connectivity of um, especially parietal frontal, but also um, subcortical and cerebellar regions are linked to changes in progestogen levels. Um, interestingly, all of them are rich in hormone receptors um, and implicated in social affective function. So now let's have a quick look at what we actually see in mood in these women. So uh, women who want to discontinue oral contraceptive use um, had significantly higher depressive symptoms than women who wanted to continue. And this uh, was significantly decreased um, after they stopped. And we saw the opposite uh, trend for a start. Um, however, we did not find a neuroendocrine correlate for depressive symptoms, but we found that the orbitofrontal gyrus connectivity is linked um, to um, mood alterations and progestogen levels um, of positive mood. So it could be a, a possible neuroendocrine substrate for these changes. With this, I would like to finish and uh, encourage you to visit my poster. And uh, we also have this um, podcast. Uh, so if you're interested in women's mental health, and since you're here, I'm pretty sure you are, uh, check it out. And um, if you didn't have the time to put the QR code in, it's also on my poster, so another reason to stop by. Thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, thanks also to everyone involved in the study. So we have time for one question, if anybody has a burning question. Or non-burning is fine too. <laughs> so sorry, I know that was so quick, but you had, what I thought was really fascinating was the people that plan, I think if I got this right, the people that plan to discontinue our contraceptive use also showed higher depressive symptoms, probably indicating why they wanted to discontinue. Did you have others 
or are you going to look at others that found their mood improved with oral contraceptives? Because I think that does happen too. And and would you maybe predict some opposite changes in the OFG patterns that you saw? Yes. So interestingly, to your first point, we did ask them why they wanted to discontinue. And most of them did not actually mention mood-related symptoms for discontinuation. And still, we found uh, this difference. So that was uh, very interesting uh, to us. Um, in our uh, sample, we did not really find that many women who profited significantly, uh, but of course there are women, um, we learned about it, PMDD, um, who might actually profit from taking oral contraceptives. So this is a really interesting avenue also to look into the future. Can we, can Claudia ask a question? Why don't we switch to the next slide and Claudia can ask. Uh, great work. Uh, I was just wondering, did you also um, ask them why they started? Yes, uh, we also asked them why they started, but we haven't really looked into the different reasons. Mostly it was new relationships starting, so that was a reason why they started, um, but they are also different. Uh, Yes, so this is also a good point uh, because we did exclude women who had um, any gynecological problems. So we did exclude women who had PMDD um, diagnosed before and we screened also for that. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dana Jarkis from Carleton University. So hi everyone, my name is Anna Jaitas. I am a PhD student in Dr. Robin McQuaid's lab at Carlton University. And today I'll be discussing for good, <laughs> a systematic review and meta-analysis on sex differences in the link between inflammation and depression. So we've said this before, depressive disorders tend to impact twice as many women compared to men. And we know that inflammation is involved in the pathogenesis of depressive disorders for some individuals. But given the heterogeneous nature of depression, it may be specific symptoms or subtypes that are more closely linked to elevations in inflammatory profiles. And it also may be the case that females are more vulnerable to inflammation-induced mood changes. And therefore, the purpose of the systematic review and meta-analysis was to examine if immune markers of inflammation are sex-specific. So to do this, we followed PRISMA guidelines and we identified papers from PubMed and PsychInfo. And we included studies that provided C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and or tumor necrosis factor alpha concentrations among males and females separately with depression and healthy controls. And we excluded uh, studies that had immune participant age below 18 or above 65, and those with comorbid physical or mental disorders. Following identification and screening, we ended up with 22 studies in total. And we ran sex-based analyses using Cohen's D, and we also assessed heterogeneity, potential covariates, and publication bias. So just to summarize the four spots that you guys are going to see, we some issues with the slides, but <laughs> we'll keep going. So we're seeing that depressed women tend to have higher CRP levels compared to healthy controls, but we don't see this effect when it comes to males. And while the mean, the magnitude of the mean difference in females is higher than that of males, this effect only approached significance, which is suggesting that females with depression tend to have higher CRP levels compared to males with depression. We have similar findings when it comes to IL-6, where again, females with depression have higher IL-6 levels compared to healthy control females, but this effect was not seen in males. And again, the magnitude of the mean difference was higher in females compared to their male counterparts, but this effect was not statistically significant. For TNF-alpha, we're seeing that overall, irrespective of sex, there is higher TNF-alpha levels in individuals with depression compared to healthy controls, but no statistically significant sex differences or sex effects. So overall, these elevations in, ele in inflammation when it comes to females may be owing to these specific symptoms that females present with when they have depression, of which would include more somatic or physical symptoms of depression. But it also may be other factors that are interacting with the immune system, such as sex steroid hormones, genetics, the environment. And altogether, the systematic review and meta-analysis does further our understanding in looking at potential sex-specific treatments for females with depression, 
which could aid in tailoring more personalized medications in the future. So thank you. And I will be having a poster tomorrow as well. So you guys can pass by and ask me questions as well if, if you'd like to. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? One question. <laughs> so um, do you include body mass index your analyses and how do you think about that? Yeah, so we did. We ran uh, BMI, we used BMI as a covariate and we didn't see that it impacted any of our analysis. Like the, it was not considered a significant covariate in any of our analyses. So, yeah. <laughs> so it was. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we just did a media analysis on cortisol in depressed females, males, and controls. And we were also looking into medication. So how does medication, antidepressant medication, actually influence your inflammation markers? So and we, well, based on the literature, we know that antidepressants tend to decrease inflammation levels. We unfortunately weren't able to look into that because there, we didn't first the number of studies were very limited. And then the amount of data we are getting out of the studies weren't as, we weren't getting as much as we needed, basically. For example, we would love to look at hormone like cycle, of course, where you are in your hormonal cycle, menopause, all of that, unable to do so, unfortunately. Yeah, would be good though. A great work, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Jana Radosavljevic from McMaster University. Hey, that was quite a mission to get up here, but I made it. <laughs> is there any way, sorry, before I begin, is there any way to have like a laser pointer type thing like this. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Jana and I'm a first year neuroscience master's student under the co-supervision of Dr. Benicio Fry and Jane Foster. And today I'll be discussing some preliminary results on sex, diagnosis and immune biotypes in depression. Now this work is ongoing. Um, but I'm excited to show you guys what the story is looking like so far. So I feel like the last uh, presentation basically covered my background, which is lovely. So I guess what I'll hammer home here is that we really do have a lack of large scale studies looking at sex differences in inflammation and depression, even fewer that look at the influence of gender. And of that, uh, studies typically examine only a few cytokines, which will limit insights into complex pathophysiology. So if we're trying to move towards precision medicine approaches, we really need to study a wider range of biomarkers so we can try to define biological subtypes of depression, which could be used to inform and target treatment. However, we need to do so in a way that's inclusive of sex and gender, which is exactly what my study aims to address. So we used a transdiagnostic trans sample of 883 participants from various canpined uh, clinical trials. We have healthy controls, individuals at high risk for depression, as well as major depression. And we measured 12 different cytokines at baseline and did a hierarchical clustering analysis to identify data-driven immune biotypes. And this is what we found. So I will walk you guys through it. So at the bottom here, we have the 12 different cytokines. And you can see that red indicates high levels of inflammation, and then down to blue indicates lower levels of inflammation. And at the side here, we can see the results of the clustering. So you can see we have these overall uh, two clusters of low and high inflammation. But within, we have these sort of distinct biotypes that represent uh, different levels of inflammation, which you can see a bit more clearly here when I've reordered it. So now we have the very high at the top down to the low inflammation biotype. And we also have, I've ordered by sex and diagnosis within each biotype you can see over here. And this is the ledger. But really the main takeaway here is that visually when we're looking at it, we're not really seeing that sex or diagnosis alone are determining what biotype you're gonna be in or what level of inflammation you're going to have. And we've started to look at this analytically as well. 
So when we compare the overall high to the overall low information group, we're not seeing a main effect of sex or diagnosis. However, it could be the interaction of these things or other variables that may be important in this, which we're addressing in our ongoing analyses. So we'll be looking at the effect of age, the impact of gender, which is heavily understudied. So we've talked a little bit about it today already. There are really important sociocultural determinants of health that may disproportionately impact men, women, and gender diverse individuals. So we need to um, look at that. Um, and yeah, many other things, treatment response, linkage with ICs. Basically, this is the story for now, um, but this is only the beginning. Thank you. So we can take one question as Madeline Wood Alexander from University of Toronto makes her way to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so I will note that all these presenters will have their posters tomorrow, so we'll have an opportunity to go chat with them and ask questions then as well. So thank you again, Yana. Thanks so much for uh, the opportunity to speak today. There's a lot of research to suggest that greater lifetime cumulative exposure to endogenous estradiol might protect women against Alzheimer's disease. Something that interests us is that women who use oral contraceptives show suppressed cumulative estradiol levels compared to women who are not on oral contraceptives. And there's some research suggesting this might even be true post-menopause after women have stopped taking the pill. Somewhat surprisingly though, there's uh, limited existing research suggesting that maybe oral contraceptives are associated with lower Alzheimer's disease risk, though there are mixed findings here. Further, ApoE4 genotype, which is a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, might modify associations of exogenous hormones with Alzheimer's disease outcomes, but this hasn't been looked at yet in the context of oral contraceptives. So our aim was to investigate whether there were interactions between oral contraceptive use and ApoE4 genotype with late life cognitive decline. Uh, to do this, we used data from around 2,800 women in the atherosclerosis risk in communities study. So the women self-reported their history of oral contraceptives in midlife, and in our analyses, we compared women who used them for two years or longer versus never used. And APOE genotype was categorized as E4 carrier versus non-carrier with E2 for heterozygotes excluded. Uh, neuropsychological tests assessed memory, executive function, and language over 10 years in late life. And we use mixed effects models to test the interaction of oral contraceptives and ApoE4 on cognitive decline, adjusting for some relevant covariates. Um, so, so the formatting is a little weird, but you can see that um, the participants were all around in their 70s at baseline. Uh, about a quarter of them were E4 carriers. And I think this got cut off, but the mean the average duration of oral contraceptive use among the using group was just under seven years. So we saw an interaction of oral contraceptive use with uh, and ApoE4 genotype on memory decline, such that um, among ApoE4 carriers who used oral contraceptives, they showed the steepest cognitive decline in memory domain. We saw a similar pattern for executive function with a significant interaction whereby oral contraceptives uh, interacted with ApoE4 to drive steeper cognitive decline in executive function domain. Uh, and in contrast, we didn't see an interaction on language. Uh, in a post-hoc analysis we, analysis, we saw that this interaction of oral contraceptives and ApoE4 was strongest in women when we increased the duration of use. Uh, so these findings suggest that oral contraceptive history and ApoE4 might together influence women's risk for cognitive decline, highlighting the importance of considering hormonal exposures across the female lifespan. 
And yeah, thank you for uh, listening. Hi, right. Ter terrific work, congratulations. So I have a question for you. Um, do you think this uh, result is uh, a reflection of the effect of oral contraceptives uh, back then? Or maybe there's something about the bias of indication and why people use uh, oral contraceptives and you have, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's um, a major concern with this type of research, especially because um, there's such a big discrepancy temporally between when women took the medication and then when we're kind of looking at the outcome. We did propensity adjust on a bunch of different factors that we thought we can, might confound the associations. And I didn't put this up here, but we also did propensity matched analyses and saw that the effect was robust, but for sure there could be some residual confounding and it's hard to say. Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> We will just move on. I'm so sorry, but again, these presenters are yeah. will be here tomorrow as well. So next up is Megan Mio from the Center of Addiction and Mental Health. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Youth Bipolar Disorder at CAMH. Um, and today I'm going to briefly review some findings looking at uh, suicidality in relation to cardiovascular risk in young women with mood disorders. So to set the scene, we know that uh, large population-based studies show that adults with mood disorders like bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and also tend to have an earlier onset of these conditions. And we know that this onset is still premature even after you account for traditional vascular risk factors like obesity and hypertension, as well as for psychiatric medication use and lifestyle. Within this, we know that there are certain subgroups where this risk is uh, even further elevated, and that includes women. So the risk of cardiovascular disease that's directly attributable to depression may be greater among women. And we also know that there's important sex and gender differences in heart-related variables, and that these differences start in adolescence and continue uh, to varying degrees throughout the lifespan. Uh, from adult studies, we also know that cardiovascular risk factors are related to worse psychiatric symptoms and to a more severe course of illness, but relatively little is known about this in youth and particularly in female youth. So for this project, we wanted to look at the relationship between an overall cardiovascular risk score and a few different measures of suicidality. So for this overall composite score, um, we summarized categories based on uh, BMI percentile, lifetime smoking, and blood pressure. So each participant received a score uh, from zero to five on these categories. Uh, and then we also looked at three measures of suicidality. Uh, we looked at lifetime suicidal ideation, lifetime non-suicidal self-injury, and a lifetime suicide attempt. So our sample for this project was 587 youth, and you can see the diagnostic breakdown on the top of the screen. Um, when we further subdivided these youth based on the different measures of suicidality, um, there's a couple, I think, key findings to highlight here. The first is that females are overrepresented in the suicide attempt and the non-suicidal self-injury or self-harm groups. 80% of both of those groups were women, and that's not a coincidence. Um, and then when we looked at the cardiovascular risk overall composite score, we found that this was significantly higher in the group with suicide attempt. Uh, it was similar in the groups with other suicidal behavior or suicidal ideation, and it was lowest in the control group. In linear regression models, when we looked at these suicide variables as predictors of cardiovascular risk, we found that it was lifetime suicide in attempt in particular that was significantly associated with this risk score. And in subgroup analyses, we found that this effect was larger and significant only in the female participants. What's also interesting here is that we didn't find any significant association between uh, the other suicide variables, so non-suicidal self-injury or ideation, with the overall cardiovascular risk score or with any of the individual risk scores. So in conclusion, we think that this could indicate potential shared biological mechanisms that link heart health and suicidality in young women. 
And it further highlights the need for unique strategies that address suicidality and heart health uh, in young women, some of which were talked about today, like exercise intervention and optimizing you know, these traditional risk factors. Thank you. All right, next up we have Romina Garcia de Leon from the Center of Addiction and Mental Health. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Romina and I'm a PhD student in Dr. Lisa Galea's lab. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about how modulating the effects of IL-1 beta impacts antidepressant efficacy in a preclinical model of postpartum depression. So why the postpartum? Well, the postpartum is the highest time of risk of depression in a female's lifetime. And the DSM-5 classifies perinatal depression as onset during pregnancy or four weeks after birth. But these two time points have very distinct signatures. The same kind of changes that we see in major depressive disorder are also seen in the postpartum, such as increased cortisol, increased pro-inflammation, and reductions to neuroplasticity and volume. And actually, cortisol is the highest during the postpartum compared to during pregnancy which is fortuitous as our lab had created a rodent model of postpartum depression um, that focused on giving high levels of cortosterone in uh, the postpartum period. And so in this model, oh no, okay, <laughs> sorry. In this model, we administer a high dose of corticosterone. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, it's just, it keeps going. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so in this model, we administer a high dose of corticosterone um, and fluoxetine. Oh my goodness. Stop, please. Okay, we administer a high dose of corticosterone and or fluoxetine, also known as Prozac, um, which is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, we're also, oh my goodness, okay. Um, okay. We're also able to probe the early postpartum through maternal care behaviors and the late postpartum um, through looking at co coping behaviors. Um, and in this model, we've consistently shown reductions in maternal care behaviors and increased ca passive coping in the late postpartum as well as reductions to hippocampal plasticity. And fluoxetine, it appears to work in the early postpartum uh, through rescuing maternal behaviors. Um, but it seems to lose efficacy in the late postpartum. And so the question then became, uh, why are antidepressants not working in the late postpartum? And so we turned to pro-inflammation, which it's been tied to antidepressant inefficacy in humans. And we had seen in our model with corticosterone in pink and fluoxetine in the hash bars, increased levels of IL-1 beta, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, so we wondered whether we could increase antidepressant efficacy through blocking IL-1 beta. So essentially, we added daily injections of anakinra, which is an IL-1 receptor antagonist um, that competitively binds to the IL-1 receptor to block the actions of IL-1 beta. And as our measure of neuroplasticity, we decided to look at something called perineural nets, which are extracellular matrix structures that inhibit plasticity. And so, uh, more perineal nets lead to less plasticity. Um, so I took a look at the ventral hippocampus, and again, pink is in cortico is corticosterone, and saw an increase in PNN expression with corticosterone, which was consistent with our findings that showed that our postpartum court model decreased neurogenesis. Fluoxetine appears to be pushing it into the right direction, but it's fluoxetine and anakinra together when PNN expression was rescued. So clearly, anakinra is boosting efficacy of fluoxetine um, in neuroplasticity. <laughs> but does it influence behavior? You can come to my poster tomorrow to find out. <laughs> All right, thank you, Romina. And our last presenter of the day, we have Serena Habib from McMaster University.
Um, picture this, you're at a research conference, which hopefully we can all picture. You've been very excited about it and you're presenting at the end of the day. A few hours in, suddenly everything starts to feel foggy. Your brain gets jumbled, you're talking to people, but you can't really concentrate and it feels like you're not there. Suddenly you're hit by a wave of exhaustion. You're fighting back tears and you really wanna cry, but you can't. You have to grin and bear it and you pull it together and deliver. When you come home, you're exhausted and you sob. This wasn't supposed to happen. You were supposed to have another week of feeling like yourself before everything fell apart. As you begin to cancel plans, you realize that everyone's gonna hate you and you hate yourself too. Everything hurts, everything sucks, and it would be easier if you weren't here. This is a glimpse into some of the participants in my study about qualitative lived experiences of PMBD and what they shared about their experiences. As Dr. Fai explained earlier, PMBD is a cyclical mood disorder with symptoms that arise during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. Participants described PMBD as a cloud using those literal words over and over again. The cloud was dark with patterns in how the suicidal ideations manifested and how they were expressed. It was foggy with this mind and body disconnect and this barrier which prevented perceptions of reality and spatiality. And it was also heavy and suffocating with this heaviness on your chest and this deep in your bones fatigue. And then while feeling like that, nobody was listening. There were extensive misdiagnoses and mistreatment which led to mistrust of the healthcare system. This included dismissal even when participants expressed suicidality to their healthcare providers and only um, providing oral contraceptives as treatment and not the ones on the clinical guidelines, so not the drosperidone containing oral contraceptive. And then finally, there was a sense of misunderstanding. So either it's just PMS and it's normal, or because you're such a high achiever during the other half of the month and everybody described themselves as being very high functioning, um, episodic disabilities don't exist and you can't get accommodations because you're making it up and you're unreliable. And so as a result, many participants expressed masking and hiding their feelings and experiences, even in intimate relationships, which really took a toll. Um, there was a sense of invisible suffering, which included lifestyle choices such as careers or children, and even canceling trips to research conferences that they had won. And pre-diagnosis, there was the sense of feeling like you're a horrible person and feeling crazy, which 20 years later, post-diagnosis, helped to figure out that, hey, a lot of this was trackable, but still there were no treatments offered to make it manageable. And so overall, the study humanizes some of the data we have on PMDD. It tells us more about what PMDD looks like, feels like, and how it's treated within our system in Canada, highlighting some of the disconnects between clinical practice and guidelines. And we can aim to address these gaps by learning from individuals' experiences. And now is a great time because April is actually PMD Awareness Month. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. All right, thank you, Serena. And let's give a round of uh, another round of applause for our seven speakers today. These individuals have really showcased their dedication and expertise and passion towards advancing women's mental health research. So again, thank you so much and check out their posters tomorrow. And I'll hand it over to Lisa for the closing remarks. Uh, see you tomorrow.